Good morning. I will try to wake you up gently with an easy example. And in this example, we start with a, a store. And this store is, has a database of all the uh, purchases that were made in the history. And in this database, there is this one customer ID, ID 911. And this customer ID has a loyalty card, and, in that, and, and because it has a loyalty card, we know that it bought a lot of stuff. Now, what the store does not know is that uh, this customer ID actually corresponds to a family of three persons. Uh, namely, the mother, who likes to buy tennis items, the father, who likes to play baseball, and the kid, who obviously buys uh, a lot of toys. Now, when the store tries to make recommendations to this family, it will run into three problems. And we call them the dominance problem, the generality problem, and the presentation problem. So let's have a closer look at them. Um, and here you see how the dominance problem materializes in this particular example, and that is that the two, uh, the top two recommendations for this family are both for the kid. And the reason for that is that the kid has purchased much more items than the mother and the father and therefore dominates the profile of the family. Another problem is that the third recommendation in this case is a USB charger. Now, how the hell is that getting here? Because the USB charger has nothing to do with tennis, also totally nothing with baseball, and the kid is also not interested in that. So the reason this pops up is because it's a very general item that is very popular and uh, is sold with a lot of stuff and therefore it also um, pops up in the top three of this family. Now suppose that we are able to solve the, previously two, the previous two problems, um, then we, we're still not there yet because suppose that uh, the father has a look at the recommendations how does he know which recommendation is meant for him? He has no way to, to know that exactly uh, at this moment. The way these kind of problems are often solved is by means of contextual information, and a very, uh, very often used one is time. However, in this case, um, we have no such information, because for this particular example, uh, the family buys all its stuff together, they have one loyalty card, and there is no way to split the profile based on contextual information. So for this work, we assume that there is no contextual information available. So let me define the scope even more clearly. So in the ideal world, we have three records in our database, one for every member of the family. And in that case, there is no problem because we can use our favorite recommender system to recommend tennis stuff to the mother, baseball stuff to the father, and toys to the kid. However, in the real world, there is only one account for the whole family, and all their purchases are mixed together. And there is no way for the store to know whether this account is shared by multiple people, if it is shared at all, and by how, by how many uh, people it would be shared. However, we do like to find some kind of magic system that is able to detect all this stuff and uh, make recommendations for every member of the family. And that's not all, because on top of that, we want the system to find a way to explain to the kid that the toy robot is for him, that the tennis shoes are for the mother, and that the baseball shirt is for the father. Now, I'm not here to propose to you a solution to this problem, because I don't have that one. Uh, at least I don't have it for every, for all of your favorite recommender systems. I do, we, d we did find a solution. If you choose your favorite recommender systems from the class of what we call item-based recommender systems, and in that case, uh, I can present something to you. So, what do I mean exactly with item-based recommenders? Well, you all know them, um, but just to be clear on this, uh, so, I mean, all the recommenders that compute the likelihood of uh, a user liking some candidate recommendation, that is computed as the sum over the purchase history uh, of, of that user. And every item in this purchase history um, contributes to this score um, with, with a number that is, that is proportional to the similarity of this item with the candidate recommendation. 
And there are many ways to compute the similarity, so the straightforward ways are to use cosine similarity or jacquard similarity or anything else. But more recently, other approaches were proposed where uh, people global, uh, minimize a global loss function to find all these similarities. And for example, the sparse linear methods are an example of that, or the Bayesian personalized ranking uh, is also an example of that. So as I said, um, <coughs> the item-based score, so the score that de determines the ranking of the items to be recommended, is a sum of item similarities. And in the case of the toy robot, this works perfectly fine. Because in the purchase history of the family, there are a lot of toys, uh, and they have big similarity with the toy robot, and it adds up to a big number, and we can definitely recommend the toy robot. Unfortunately, also the USB charger uh, ends up high in the list of recommendations. And this is not because there is some very similar item in the purchase history, it is because this USB charger has a mild average similarity with actually every item in the purchase history. And that's unfortunate. Also unfortunate is that um, the, the baseball helmet, which is actually a very good recommendation for the father, gets a very low score. And the reason for that is that there are only three items in the purchase history um, that, that have a high similarity uh, to the baseball helmet, and apparently that's not enough to give it a high score. And a similar story holds for the tennis shoes, which are a good recommendation for the mother. So, to do something about that, the first step that we do is that we adjust these item-based scores by, um, by dividing them by a number that is proportional to the number of items in the purchase history. So in this case, every purchase history has 11 items. So we divide every score by 11 to the power p, where p is a number between 0 and 1. Now, of course, in this, just doing this doesn't change a thing, because every recommendation score is divided by the same number, and hence the relative scores of all these items does not change at all. However, it is a crucial ingredient for what we are going to do next, and that is we will not consider only the full purchase history of this family, but we will consider every possible subset of the purchase history. Now, for this purchase history of 11 items, there are more than 2,000 possible subsets that they did not fit on my slide, so I only show you five. Um, but from all these possible subsets, we choose the one that maximizes the score of the helmet in this case. And in this case, the, the subset that maximizes the score of the helmet is a subset of three items, and it's all baseball items. And as you can see, by removing all the items with very small similarities to the target recommendation, we only slightly reduce the nominator of this number, because they were small anyway. However, the denominator decreases a lot from 11 to the power p to 3 to the power p. And as such, we have drastically increased the score uh, of the baseball helmet. And not surprisingly, this, um, this subset that maximizes the score for the helmet corresponds to the history, the purchase history of the father alone. So that's actually what we want. <coughs> so you can see that for the tennis shoes at the bottom of the slide, uh, a similar story holds, uh, and as we would like it, uh, the relative score of the USB charger drops dramatically. And the reason for that is that there was no way to remove uh, noise items from the, from, the, from the past purchases to increase the score of the USB charger. So, so we couldn't improve that score. And therefore, in a relative way, it, it became uh, very small, which was actually what we wanted to happen. Now, you might have already thought, well, that's all nice, but taking the maximum over all possible subsets, that's taking the maximum over more than 2,000 different numbers, and this is only for a toy example. So, yeah, computing that, that's, you have to do that in exponential time, and, and you can't do that, actually. Fortunately, we show you in the paper that we can prove that this optimal subset, you can find it in n log n time, uh, because if you rank all items according uh, to their similarity to the target recommendation, then this optimal subset has to be a prefix of this ranking. So by doing that, you can find this optimal subset uh, much more efficiently. So that's our solution to the generality problem. And as you will see in, my, uh, in the next part of my talk, 
uh, the solution for the two other problems uh, comes almost for free after having solved this one. So you see here uh, the recommendations we have until now for our family. And as we wished, the recommendation for the USB charger has moved to the bottom of the list and is not significant anymore. However, we still have a problem because the top three recommendations are still all for the kit. And that's not what we want. Fortunately, our recommender system is able to detect this. And it does this by means of the subset of the purchase history that maximizes uh, this recommendation score because this subset serves as an explanation for why this, uh, this item is recommended. And these subsets correspond uh, more or less to the, to the histories of the individual family members. So in this case, the recommender system detects that um, that both the first and the second recommendation are for the same person and therefore removes the second one. And as such, a new item can enter the top three recommendations. And in this case, it's an item for the father. So we're moving in the good direction. Same thing for the next candidate recommendation. So again, it detects that, that it's also for the kid. It removes it and as such, again, a new recommendation can enter the top three. Uh, and yes, this is for the mother. Of course, we know it's for the mother and the father. Uh, and the recommender system also does because it checks uh, the explanation. It sees that it is different different from, from the first explanation. So it keeps the recommendation and the same one for, for the tennis shoes. So as such, we have also solved the dominance problem. And for solving the presentation problem, we will not just simply show to this family their three recommendations. No, we will accompany every recommendation by its explanation. And by looking at the explanations, the family members will know, okay, this is, for example, the father recognizes the baseball stuff he bought, and in that, in that way he knows that the helmet is meant for him. So this is the solution that we propose uh, for these three problems. We tested our solution on uh, four real data sets, uh, and I'm, but uh, in the interest of time, I will only show you the results on one data set. And what you see here is this data set, which um, is, consists of the, um, the histories of a number of users. And to every user, based on its history, of course, we will make five ideal world recommendations. So, and we use for that an item-based uh, an item-based recommender, of course. And in this case, we use cosine similarity as a similarity measure. Um, and what we do next is that we split this uh, this data set into randomly into subsets, and we give them a color to to make the distinction clear. And what we will do next is that we will merge the two data sets in a way that every blue user shares an account with one red user. So we have created shared accounts of, of two users, a blue one and a red one. And now that we have this shared account, we make recommendations to this shared account and we give them, each shared account we give 10 recommendations. Now, we can create these recommendations now in two ways. Uh, the first way is that we ignore the fact that these are shared accounts. We try to forget them. We do a Hail Mary and we hope everything goes well by just using a traditional item-based recommender. The second uh, case is that we acknowledge that these are shared accounts or possibly shared accounts. And we know that there are problems associated with that. And therefore, we use our algorithm uh, to generate these recommendations. And we hope uh, we get better results in that way. Now, what you can see is in these recommendations is that some of these recommendations will be the ideal world recommendations of the blue users. Other recommendations will be the ideal world recommendations of the red user. And yet other recommendations will be just some other ones, not the ideal world ones for the blue and not the ideal world recommendations for the red user. So if we encounter a list of recommendations that contains at least one blue ideal recommendation and one red ideal recommendation, we're fine with that. Okay, I know it's only, for every user, it's only one in 10 that's right, but um, it's a very hard problem and we're already, uh, we already think this is quite something. However, if uh, there is not a single recommendation that corresponds to an ideal world recommendation for the red user, 
then we say, okay, for this red user, we have a problem and it's not okay. This is a serious problem. And similarly, uh, if uh, a blue recommend, if there is a blue ideal world recommendation missing, we also say this is not okay. Obviously, if for both the blue and the red one, uh, an ideal world recommendation is missing, it's two times not okay. So what we did is we looked at all users in the data set and we counted the number of times that, a, that, that the situation was not okay for a user. So the more, the, the higher the number, the worse. So the lower, the better. And we did not only uh, merge two users, as I just showed you, but we also did the experiment when merging three users and even four users. And what you can see is that, first of all, uh, if you merge more users, the problem gets harder, and all algorithms are performing worse, because their scores of uh, the number of not okay users goes up. Um, and then the second thing you can see is that, uh, the item-based system in which we ignore the fact that these accounts were shared by multiple, multiple users performs the worst, which is not surprising, of course. And the algorithm we propose um, performs the best, which was obviously what we intended to happen. Another uh, interesting um, property of, 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 of the algorithm that we propose is the fact that it uh, gives these explanations to the recommendations. Uh, and we're going to check the quality of these recommendations. So suppose you have a family, in this case only of two persons. So this was before the kid was there. Um, and again, uh, the guy buys the baseball items, the woman likes to play tennis, and we recommend to them, to this family of two, a baseball shirt. Now the best possible explanation uh, for recommending this baseball shirt is uh, actually all baseball items, obviously, which are all the items bought by, by the guy. And we, we quantify this by saying that the identifiability of this uh, explanation is one, which is the highest possible number for an identifiability. Uh, and why is that? Well, because by looking at the explanation, the guy will have no doubt that this is a recommendation for him because all the items in the recommendation were bought by, by him. So, so he's absolutely sure this is a recommendation for him. However, if the algorithm would also add the tennis ball, for example, to the, to the explanation, well, in that case, the guy is going to doubt. Okay, it seems to be a recommendation for me because all my baseball stuff in there, but hey, I didn't buy the tennis ball, so... That's kind of strange, so he's starting to doubt. And the more non-relevant items that are added to the, to the explanation, the more the guy is going to doubt whether the recommendation is for him. And we quantify this by reducing the identifiability. So in the second case, the identifiability is only three in four. In the last case, the identifiability is only three in five. So we looked at all the recommendations we made and their corresponding explanations, and we made a histogram of the identifiability of, of all the recommendations. Um, and what you see for when we ignore the fact that these accounts are shared and, and we just use the item uh, normal item-based recommender, you see that the identifiability is all over the place. So some user, some explanations have a high identifiability, but many more have a low one, and that's absolutely not good. Because users will not be able to, 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 to see which recommendations are for them. However, when we use our algorithm, uh, we see that, that the situation is much better, and more than half of the explanations have a perfect identifiability, meaning that Indeed, our solution uh, is in the good direction for solving this presentation problem. So in summary, um, when you recommend to share accounts, we identified three problems, the generality problem, the dominance problem, and the presentation problem. And therefore, we proposed a solution that works in case that the reference recommender system that uh, creates the ideal world recommendations is a uh, item-based recommender. Thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer any questions. More than 10 minutes for questions, so it was very fast. Okay, please. 
Cohen, thanks very much. It, it was worth getting up this morning to hear your talk. Um, it strikes me that perhaps this is also another way of enhancing the diversity of recommendations in the case of a single user account. Is that something you've looked at? Yes, definitely. So a single user with, let's say, multiple personalities, that's, let's say, a mild case of, it's a milder case of this problem, and you can definitely use it for that. However, uh, it's, uh, um, it's much more difficult to invent, let's say, a, a test setup where you can test this kind of stuff. Um, we, comp because we, we also compared, so one of the algorithms we compared with was, and that's the, the yellow one in this case, it's actually a simple uh, item-based recommender where, where we tried to have some diversity. So it was to check uh, our solution. Is it simply because we build in the diversity that it is better? Uh, so it's definitely one of the, of the aspects, but what we see is that the quality of the explanations is also better and, and that uh, allows us to, to uh, do the diversity in a, in a better way. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. So in your modeling of the problem, you assumed that the item sets of the family members are disjoint, uh, which may not be the case in reality. Uh, so how do you deal with this? Well, I, 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 I kind of put this under the rug to make the presentation uh, easy, more easily. But what can definitely happen is that there are some item uh, where, the, where the optimal subset, for example, is a mix between items purchased by one family member and the ones by the other one. This is not necessarily uh, a problem because that means that, for example, the, the, the part of the, for example, the mother's and the father's taste coincides and, and then the recommendation is, for example, something they could do together. So it finds meaningful subsets and oftentimes these meaningful subsets correspond to individual users, but it is definitely also possible that, that it is a, a combination of, of two users. But it, it should be meaningful anyway. I was wondering if uh, this might also be able to solve another similar problem, which is um, on my own I might have that purchase history and I'm still not interested in USB chargers, but I'm interested in baseball, tennis, and children's games. Um, is, would this also be an approach you would recommend for that kind of problem, or do you think it uh, wouldn't work uh, in the case of single people? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. So uh, a single person might have a multi-profiled profile, and I was wondering if your approach would also help to solve that kind of problem. So your question was whether this also works when a single person has multiple tastes? Yeah, definitely. It's only, as I just said to, to Derek, it, it's a mild case. So, so this is like the extreme case. And if you have a single user with multiple tastes, you could consider that to be a, a, a mild, a, a lighter version of, of, of this problem. So although I have no way to test that, I have no data that allows me to, in my opinion, you can also use it for that, yes. I'm just wondering, if, since you're doing an item-based recommendation, uh, you could probably group the items according to their similarity to each other, and maybe you could get an emergence of two uh, distinct patterns, you know, two distinct groupings within your results, and then your user on the interface may have the ability to switch between those two groupings and allow those groupings to be identified per person. So you could say that, you know, basket A of movies all relate to each other or are a good match, item-based. Basket B are also a good match, although two groups are uh, disparate. You could use that to identify the two personalities. Yeah, I'll, I'll get, just get up a slide to, to explain better. Hmm. So in this case, for example, um, I just removed the second and the third recommendation, but you could see this as in, instead of removing the second and the third one, you could, you could like cluster them 
and, 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 and show that they belong together and that they are for the same person. Now, in this case, it is very important that uh, you do not cluster, simply cluster the items um, by, by computing the similarity score based on the users that uh, bought the item, because um, in that case, for example, assume you have a, a black and a white coffee machine. Uh, if you cluster them like that, black and white coffee machines will absolutely not be similar because the customer buys either the black one or the white one. Uh, so you want to cluster them based on the explanations, as, as I do right here, and, and in that case it would definitely work. That was really a really great presentation, and I'm sorry that I missed the first few minutes. Uh, did you mention that how you identify how many people share one account, so how you can specify that it is two, three, or four uh, people sharing the account? So um, this algorithm does not uh, detect the exact number of people sharing an account. So it actually only splits them implicitly. Uh, because it can very well happen that if a person has two distinct, so if there are, for example, three persons in a family, but one of these persons has a, uh, has two very distinct tastes, that the algorithm will act as if there are actually four persons in the family. Uh, or if two persons have a taste that, that goes together, it will, um, it, it will group those. So it doesn't, the algorithm doesn't explicitly split these accounts because that's a very error prone job. Um, actually, the splitting is kind of soft and implicit and follows from the way how the algorithm works. No question. But I have a question for you. Oh, this is customized for item to item uh, collaborative filtering. Have you thought about how to generalize it to other methods, like let's say classical matrix factorization? Well, what is specific to, to this method that probably is, would be make it difficult to make a transition to other methods? Yes. So um, it works. And, and, and this is crucial, uh, the, the, your, your ideal world recommender, which, which you uh, supposed to be a good one for the individual users, needs to be item to item. It doesn't really need to use an explicit similarity measure like cosine similarity, but it can also be one of the more recent techniques such as the sparse linear methods uh, or the, uh, where, where the, the similarities are actually found by minimizing a global optimization function or uh, with the BPR criterion, for example. But it needs to be a method that computes the recommendation score as a sum over item because we take these subsets and we find this optimal subset. And as soon as you lose that, as soon as you re uh, represent a, a profile, not as a sparse vector in a high dimensional world, but as a dense vector in a low dimensional uh, setting, then you can't do this anymore. So that's the limitation of this method. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, the, the speaker again. <laughs>
We can also find some reviews written by these alien users. And we can find other similar experts on uh, uh, social platforms such as Foursquare and Facebook and online platforms such as Amazon and uh, WebMD where users can post specific medical questions where doctors can reply to. So given this importance of experts, so previous works have been tr focused on trying to find general topic experts uh, with broad appeal, such as a top Java developer in an enterprise or uh, such like the best lawyers in Vienna. So, but a lot of times we're more, we care more about like personally relevant experts. So to give you an example, we have four uh, food experts on Twitter and we have two users, Frank and Alice. So probably these two users will be interested in Twitter food or Twitter network because these two Twitter accounts are very popular and followed by a lot of users. But what if we're giving some more uh, personal information to Alice, such as Alice lives in Vienna. So we can imagine that Alice would be very interested in food drink Europe or food Vienna even though these two Twitter accounts are not that popular, but they provide local food information uh, in the same region as where Alice lives in. So uh, we can imagine that geolocation would be a very important factor that might affect users' preferences over experts. So in this talk, we're gonna be focused on a problem called personalized expert recommendation. So to give you a more problem, official problem statement, we're given a set of users and a set of experts, and each user has some preference over experts. And our task is to identify the top end personally relevant experts for this user. So one of the standard models for this recommendation problem would be uh, matrix factorization where we can view users' preference over experts as a matrix Y where each value of Y would indicate whether this user is interested in this expert or not. So uh, matrix factorization tries to find a lower dimensional representation for, this, for these users and experts. And to, pre to predict a missing value a yij, we can use the product of the i throw of expert and the jth column of experts. And a lot of times we can add a bias term, uh, which we use bj to indicate expert popularity. So besides these user preferences over experts, and we have seen from previous examples, uh, geolocation is a, a factor that might affect users' preferences. So actually, we have many other factors that may affect users' preferences, such as age, gender, or education. But in this talk, we're gonna be focused on three factors, geolocation, topic, and social relationships. Specifically, we're gonna be asking these two key questions. One, do region, topic, and social-based locality exist? And two, if so, how do we integrate and model each of them? So before we ask, we answer these questions, let's, move, let's explain the data we use. So in order to find a suitable data set that we use, we're gonna be resort to a specific data format called Twitter lists, where we can see that each list is a group of members curated by a user, a Joe here, and oftentimes this user will put some word labels to indicate the topic of this list. And we can see from this figure that uh, group members are usually Twitter accounts which are very popular and often focused on uh, posting tweets on a specific topic as indicated by topic labels. So in our analysis, we will treat these list members as experts and uh, labelers as users. And additionally, we also collected geo-coordinates for each user and expert. 
because uh, we want to use these geo coordinates to explore the user preferences over experts. So uh, to sum up, to sum up, we have about uh, 100,000 geotag lists with about 50. 100 geotag experts across multiple topics. So we have seen the data. So um, how would uh, geolocation and topic affect users' preferences? So specifically, how does geolocation affect labelers' preferences over experts? So uh, let me first give you two figures of spatial distribution, where the left one indic uh, is the labelers' spatial distribution for uh, food experts from San Francisco. And the right figure is labelers spatial distribution for food experts from Chicago. So we can see from these two figures that um, experts from these two cities are mostly labeled by local labelers. So get, to give you a more quantitative characterization of these uh, observations, we first discretize the whole United States into a grid. And for a specific U expert, E, and a specific region, Ri, we can compute a probability that uh, each labeler is going to locate in this specific region, Ri. Then we rely on a information theory measure called entropy to uh, characterize this randomness of probabilities. So we can interpret this entropy measure as a popularity indicator for each expert. And uh, if the entropy is high, then we can imagine that uh, labelers are uh, distributed across the country. And if the entropy is low, then the labelers would be more focused on a few regions. So let's look at how uh, average expert entropy for experts from different cities. So we can see from this table that experts from big cities, such as New York and San Francisco, would have a relatively higher entropy than those experts from the rest of the cities, such as Houston, Chicago, Seattle, or Denver. So then we have our first observation, which is that Experts from different geolocations may have different levels of popularity across the country. So how do we integrate this observation into our uh, recommendation? So first, let me give you some intuitive example where we have some experts and users from these two cities. And we have a user without knowing his geo information. So who would we recommend? So probably, we will recommend Alice, because Alice is the most popular expert. But what if we have a user, and we know that this user is at Chicago? So who would we recommend? So probably, we would recommend uh, this expert, Mike, because Mike is the most popular expert in Chicago, uh, based on previous observation. So now we have our first intuition, which is that users may be recommended with the most popular expert in the same region as users. So how do we exactly uh, model this intuition? So we will propose a concept called regional popularity. We have this matrix S, and each element of Sij would is used to capture the degree of expert EJ popular, uh, receives in the region RI. And by linearly adding this into the previous model, we have our geo-enhanced factorization. So given this model, we would like this model to, uh, to, uh, to recommend a popular regional expert if we know the location of a user. So we have no, and notice that this regional popularity matrix would reduce to uh, BJ if the number of grids is equal to one. So we have seen how geo in, uh, would affect user's preference. How about topic? So as in before, we showed two uh, 
figures of spatial distribution, where the left one shows labeled spatial distribution for food experts from San Francisco, and the right one shows the labeled uh, dis spatial distribution for technology experts from San Francisco. So as we can see from these two figures, technology labelers for technology experts uh, may be lo uh, located across the country where labelers for food experts may, uh, are mostly local. So we can also see some uh, expert entropy for experts for, for, uh, for different topics. And we can see from this table that food experts usually have the lowest entropy than those uh, experts such as celebrities or technology experts. That means food experts are mostly labeled by local users. So now we have our second observation, which is that expert locality can vary by topic. So in the perspective of users, users' uh, geographic preference may differ because of their topic interests. So how do we integrate this observation in our model? So also, let's give, uh, give you an intuitive example. We have several experts, and we have some users in these two cities. And we have a user, and we know she's at Chicago. So as in before, um, we probably would recommend Alice, because Alice is the most popular expert in Chicago. But what if we have a user, and this user is at Chicago, and interested in tech? So in this case, we're probably very certain that we would recommend Bob or Mike, because these are also both uh, technology experts. But who would we recommend first? So probably, we would recommend Bob, because Bob is the most popular expert labeled by users in Chicago, even though Bob is at San Francisco. So now we have our second intuition, which is that the recommendation should consider regionally popular experts with similar interests as users. So how do we integrate this intuition into the, into the model? So here, we're going to propose a topic-based preference score where we have a latent topic factor for each user, and we have a topic factor for each expert, and we use this inner product to indicate the topic preference score for this expert and this user. So by linearly adding this in a product into the previous model, we have our geotopic enhanced factorization. So the purpose of this model is that if we are given the location of a user and her topic interests, we would want that uh, uh, an expert to be recommended for this user, which is who is both topically and geographically relevant. So now we have seen uh, how social relationships, uh, we have seen how geo and topic inf affect users' preference. Let's move on to see how social relationship might affect users' relation, uh, preference. So let's look at the first case where one expert is socially connected to the other, where we have Frank is socially connected to Bob. And for this user, Alice, we would probably recommend Bob before Mike because Bob is socially connected to Frank. So here, we propose to um, minimize a weighted preference, a weighted difference between two experts' latent factors. By doing this, we're trying to enforce that the condition that the two uh, latent factors of these two experts who are socially connected would be similar to each other. So we have our second case, which is we can use the same principle uh, as, in this, as in the first case. And we have our third case where a user is also uh, socially connected to an expert. So we explain that um, we will uh, ignore the details, but technically we will add a bias term to the previous model. So we have our final model, which is called geotopic enhanced factorization with social regularization. 
So let's move on to experiments, where we're going to be asking three questions. One, how well does our proposed method perform compared to alternative baselines? And second, do region topic-based locality give improvement individually, and do they complement each other? And three, do social-based locality give improvement individually, and do they complement each other? So we have these baselines, and the first one is expert popularity, where we rank experts by popularity and recommend the top, uh, the most popular experts. And the second is the standard user-based collaborative filtering, and the third is the basic matrix factorization, and the rest of the methods are all based on matrix factorization, with each enhanced by only geo, or enhanced by topic, or by both topic and geo, or by social relationships. So for evaluation, we will randomly select about 50% of experts for training and use the rest of them for testing. And we will use standard metrics such as precision at K and recall at K for evaluation. So how does our proposed method perform? So we can see from this figure that our proposed method uh, generally gives the best uh, improvement over all methods. So specifically, it provides about 24% improvement and 21% improvement for precision and recall over the best of user collaborative filtering and matrix factorization. And do region and topic-based locality give improvement individually? So let's look at this table where we can see that both geo and topic enhanced factorization will give about 4% improvement for precision, where the combination of these two uh, factors will give about 7% improvement for precision, which is approximately the addition of the previous two kinds of improvement. So we can say that these two types of information can complement each other. And also, does social-based locality will gi uh, give improvement individually? And we can see from this table that each social relationship can give certain improvement over the basic matrix factorization, where we can see that the relationship between user expert would provide the best improvement overall, where the user and user relationship provides the least improvement. And the combination of these three relationships will give the best improvement, where it's about 21%, which is also approximately the summation of the previous three different kinds of improvement given by each social relationship. So we can also conclude that these three types of uh, social relationship would complement each other. So for, con for conclusion, we first studied the problem of personalized expert recommendation and proposed a matrix-based uh, factorization-based uh, approach. And we studied how region, topic, and social relationships might affect users' preference over experts and integrate them into our model. And third, we showed that the proposed method gives about 24% improvement and 21% improvement in precision and recall. That's it. Thank you. Questions? There, yeah, we have one. Thank you for your presentation. I think that this topic is really relevant. I mean, the topic of personalized uh, expert recommendation. Uh, so the first question is, um, as I have understood, uh, you have you represent popularity uh, by using entropy, right? So the popularity of the expert is represented by the entropy, right? So you compute the entropy of that expert. Yes. Okay. So uh, have you tested if there is a correlation between the popularity and also the entropy of the expert, or this is just an intuition that you? have put into your um, algorithms. Well, and, and the second, the second okay. question, I mean, it's, it's not a question, but an issue I found here is that uh, I have a paper on Sunday in which we work, uh, we have analyzed the importance of diversity 
on, you know, on user-based recommendations. Um, so our first intuition was that we have to filter the, uh, the users that uh, provide recommendation to, an, to a target user. This was our first intuition. But we tested that intuition and it was wrong. So we found that the more diverse the panel of experts were used to provide recommendations was better for recommendation. I don't know if here we could have the, uh, the same problem. Uh, so the first question is about correlation yeah. between entropy, entropy and, popularity. and popularity, right? And second question is that if you filter the experts, you are probably using, uh, uh, losing important information for recommendation because you are losing diversity. Uh, for the first question, uh, we, <coughs> we here, we use like, uh, we use entropy as a measure to like help us find, uh, find this discovery where uh, we found that experts like uh, experts' popularity can be uh, can vary by regions, by geolocations. So here, entropy is more like a indicator or uh, a more quantitative measure that we use to uh, help us uh, find this kind of observation. But we di we didn't really use this entropy in our recommendation in our model. We use this as a uh, like intuitive measure for us to uh, uh, find us uh, a specific way to include uh, uh, like this uh, popularity. Like we, we are like, uh, we use this regionally popularity and this concept to uh, like to connect this kind of phenomenon to uh, what we have observed in entropy. So we didn't use specifically the specific entropy into popularity, but we are certain that there's a relationship between entropy and the popularity. My specific question is if entropy is a good indicator of popularity. Is an indicator? Is it good? Is the best the good indicator of popularity? Uh, I think it is. I think because you can view entropy as like a randomness of the spatial distribution of experts. So if the entropy is high, then the labeler would be uh, located, will be distributed across the whole country. Instead of if, if we have a lower entropy, then the labelers would be certainly focused or located in just a few regions. So I think that is definitely a good indicator of experts' popularity. And the second question is that, uh, um, I'm sorry, what's the second question? It's yeah. about diversity. If you filter the experts by these factors, are you losing information because of your cutting or reducing the diversity of the expert? Uh, we haven't thought about like this diversity. If we reduced experts on these three topics, uh, we certainly can try to do some experiments on this kind of uh, recommendation where we reduce those factors. So maybe, yeah, we can maybe talk more after the talk if you're interested. A question? Hi, I have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, in your presentation, uh, uh, you compare this uh, improvement provided by this locality and the social relationship. And apparently, social relations are much more stronger. The effect of social relations is much more stronger than locality. So, uh, um, I, I think that the title is a bit strange because it's putting the emphasis of locality, but actually, the results are stronger for <laughs> social relationships, yeah, um, which are not related to locality because so, it's just, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, actually, that's that's a good point, and we also like we have also considered this kind of uh, questions or uh, as as before uh, before. Um, but our point is so sometimes we don't have these social relationships. So these are like uh, extra information that we have. So uh, if we don't have these social relationships, we can still. Uh, improve the recommendation performance only by geo location or by topic information. So uh, 
So, so these three kinds of information are like complementary to each other, where we not we we don't specifically focus on uh, social relationship. We only saying that social relationship can help improve our recommendation performance. So uh, I think that's our point, which is that these three types of information are complementary to each other. Uh, hi, so uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. Actually, I have a question concerning your data set. Okay. Is it just about food? Was it just about food? Actually, we have used the uh, uh, Twitter list across different topics, such as uh, food, news, and uh, like uh, technology or uh, some other topics. We actually used uh, six different topics on these experiments. And if you're interested, you can uh, look at our paper to see more details about experiments for each topic. Okay, yes. about, this was my question. About okay. like each topic, what is the, the improvement over each topic? Maybe it's going to be different. Yes, because, uh, yes that's exactly. So uh, we, can, we have kind of different improvements for different topics, but in average, we have our uh, improvement as we uh, specified in the talk. Okay, thank you. Okay, so no more questions. Let's thank again the speaker. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here for my talk. Uh, this presentation is about a recommendation problem in the domain of venture finance. It's a new domain for making recommendations. So venture finance is the financing of private companies through the use of venture capital. Venture capital is managed by a venture capital firm. And beyond fundraising, a venture capital firm is also responsible of uh, sourcing opportunities, making investment decisions, and also, uh, also, uh, and also uh, take, taking the board membership of the investee private companies. This relationship can be summarized into a bipartic relationship between the venture capital firms and the investees. And usually the investees are startups. So we can see this uh, relationship is quite similar uh, with the traditional uh, recommendation systems. In our problem, the VCs, they seek and they invest into startups and it is similar to the movie watching or the music listening behaviors, as the user also seek and like uh, or watch the movie or listen to the music. And that forms the first uh, motivation why we conduct this research. There have been very few studies that have focused on this specific area. And there was one work uh, two years ago published in CIKM, which applied top-end recommendation algorithm directly to the venture finance problem. However, that work only focused on a direct application, and it didn't consider the specific characteristic of this problem. So what, so what is special for this problem? An essential question about venture finance is how to uh, estimate and control risk. It is not as general as movie watching or music listening, where, the, uh, where risk is also important, but it's not as essential. So here we have the two panels to show this motivation. The left panel, we sh uh, in these two figures, we compare the mean and variance between the recommendations made by a direct application of PMF, probabilistic metric factorization, and the ground truth. And the data set is crunch-based, which I'm going to describe a little bit later. And we can see that in 76% cases, the recommendations made by PMF uh, have higher mean. And higher mean here means actually higher relevance. So actually, the recommendations have higher relevance to, to the users. However, on the other hand, we have 83% of cases that the true ground truth 
uh, have lower variance, which is an indicator of lower risk. These two figures indicate that actually in the investment behaviors, the VCs has already considered the risk factor. That, in other words, if we consider risk in recommendation algorithms, we may also improve our performance. So how do we treat the risk? We, we know that diversification is very popular in reducing the risk in the traditional recommender systems. And this diversification is usually the diversification of the recommendation list itself. That, is, that means that because the user's previous listening or movie watching kind of behaviors, they do not necessarily influence their future decisions. And that's by, therefore, uh, we only need to diversify the recommendation list, for example, like topic diversification, and that's enough. However, for an investor, the investor ha may have already held several investments. And therefore, in order to consider future investments, they have to fit them into their already uh, holding portfolio. That means when we consider recommendation, we cannot consider the recommendation, uh, the diversification of the recommendation list alone. We actually have to fit them to help the investor to offset some of the risk in their original and uh, originally holding investments. Therefore, we actually consider the diversification of the whole list, including both the holding investments and the recommendations. We call it as a joint investment portfolio. And before continuing with the algorithms, I'm going to talk a little bit of the data set we collected and used in this research. Uh, we use Crunchbase, which is a repository of startup companies, individual partners, and financial institutes focusing on the US high tech sectors. And on the, from the website, we can find out the time and the amount of investment between the VC to the uh, startups. How we don't use, but the amount here is not very exact because it only contains the total amount in a fundraising round raised by a startup. Therefore, in our experiment, we don't use this information. This data set has several uh, unique features compared to a uh, movie lens or Netflix, uh, these classic recommendation data set. The first difference lies in the category di distribution. The category for Crunchbase is the uh, industrial sectors uh, each VC uh, has invested in. And it for uh, movie lens is the general number. We can see that in Crunchbase data set, uh, users tend to uh, be interested in only a small number of categories. So they're, they're more concentrated. However, in movie lines, uh, the users tend to have a wider range of interests. This suggests us that we cannot use a topic diversification for this problem because uh, VCs don't usually uh, interest in several different uh, sectors. Second difference lies in the sparsity. We know, we know that recommender system is, uh, is extremely sparse already, but the crunch-based data set, even if it has, it has collected 27 years of data set investment behaviors, the sparsity is still very low. It is 197th of movie lens and 125th of Netflix. This also reinforces our motivation that we have to be very cautious when recommending uh, new opportunities to the investor because they, are, they, because they must be very cautious in considering the factor of risk. So we go back to the objective. That is, we want to optimize the joint portfolio. And the portfolio includes both the previous ones and the future recommendations. 
And by saying the optimization problem, we have to define the utility. So we, we want to find out which recommendation combination can bring the highest utility for this particular VC. This objective function uh, can be written in this equation, which consists of two steps. And the first, uh, before that, I'm going to give several definitions. First of all, portfolio. A portfolio, we call it PJ, where J is the recommendation list. And because I uh, is determined by each use by VC already, we don't include I here. And the portfolio PJ is a joint portfolio uh, with both the holding investment and the future uh, recommendations together with the weights associated to each individual startups. And the weights here are determine the utility. So the utility is the trade-off between the relevance and uncertainty. It is the expected relevance minus B times of uncertainty. And uh, here the W, which is the weight, can take part in calculating the uh, utility function. And B here is the risk-averse level. The higher B is, the more risk-averse the VC is. So the first step, portfolio optimization, is to find the optimal weight that can bring the uh, best utility uh, given a certain list of uh, startups. So here we have already assumed that a VC can change the priority or to change the weights uh, in order to achieve the maximally achievable utility given the list. And the second step is the startup selection. That is, when we have a list, we iterate through all the combinations uh, in the candidate pools so that we can see which group of recommendations can bring the highest utility. For the first step, portfolio weight optimization, we need two essential factors, expectation and variance. And thank, uh, thanks to uh, PMF, we can have the mean and variance of the latent factors, which can further generate the mean and variance of the combination of uh, startups. So we have PQ uh, as the uh, expectation of the re relevance, and we can also calculate covariance between startups. And then we reduce this problem as a, a optimization problem uh, in which we need to find out the optimal W. And this problem has been solved by a previous problem, a previous work published also in Rexis. So here we go to the second problem. That is, how do we find out the combination which can lead to the optimally achievable utility? And before that, we have to, I have to emphasize that we have to uh, give, given that we have to find out the combination first, and then we t determine the weight, which means that the exact solution requires us to iterate through all the combinations, which is a huge number. And this is uh, infeasible in practice, so we have to approximate it. We proposed uh, five algorithms to approximate this uh, solution. Sampling, individual score ranking, sequential selection, weight ranking, and weight filtering. So sampling is the most straightforward way to approximate exact solution. Uh, and by the way, before all of these two uh, algorithms, we first filter out a top end candidate list by using PMF uh, directly, which means we uh, significantly reduce the computation uh, space. And after that, uh, in sampling method, we sample n-sized startup combinations, and we uh, find out the optimal weights uh, of the joint portfolio with both the coding portfolio and the future recommendations. 
And then we find out the uh, utility of each combination. And we pick the top one. In the second algorithm, individual square ranking, we, instead of uh, finding the combination itself, we put each individual uh, startup and jointly putting them together with the holding portfolio. And then we calculate the optimal ways and get the optimal utility. And then we uh, list it and find the top end. So this is basically an index-based solution. And thirdly, a sequential selection. So we first use individual score ranking to find the first one, and we fix it, and we find the second one by uh, increasing the, the size until we have obtained N. Fourth, so, uh, weight ranking. And in this method, we put all the candidates uh, together with the holding portfolio. And we calculate the weights of all of them. And we select the top N. So in this way, actually, uh, we just note that when we actually use this top end and jointly put them together with the holding portfolio, the weights have already changed. So this is a, a more approximate solution. And finally, weight filtering. This is the, the other way around. That is, we first calculate all the weights together, and we filter out the, the one with the least weight, and then we calculate the gain of the weights and filter out the other one. And then we do com repeat this process until we obtain only n. There is a very important factor here that is the risk averse level. And we conduct both non-adaptive solution, which means that we select a certain B for all of the VCs, and also adaptive, which means we use a validation set to determine the B for each VC and apply it in the test set, in the experiment. And we label the first type of algorithms are as portfolio, and the second type as portfolio A. So here are the experimental results. In order to do experiment, we first divide the data set into uh, two categories, training set and the test set. We do it by uh, cutting it according to time, and two-thirds of the investment behaviors lie into the training set, and the remaining one-third of activities are in the test set. And then by applying PMF to the training set, we obtain the latent factors, uh, as well as the uh, mean and variance of them. And then, after doing that, we obtain the top N candidate list uh, by directly applying PMF to reduce the computational space. So, for the, the first uh, experiment is conducted with N equals one, which means we simply looking at how it performs when we only select uh, one startup uh, to recommend to the uh, each VC. And in this way, all of the five algorithms actually reduce to the same strategy. And we come from these two figures. The left figure is uh, when k equals to 25, and the right figure is when k equals to 50, and k is the dimension of the latent space. We can see that in, bo in both cases, uh, either a portfolio or portfolio A uh, performs better than PMF. And here are the performance versus parameters B and parameter N, which is the candidate set size. The first figure indicates that there is a range that if we consider there is a general risk averse level, uh, we can see that uh, there is a general risk averse level for all the candidates, for all the VCs, so that the performance achieved the best. The second figure, we can see that uh, when we enlarge the candidate set size, the performance first increases and then drops a little bit. And we as ascribe the drop of the performance to uh, the overfitting of the model. So when uh, there are too many candidates, actually the, uh, the uh, algorithms may confuse. 
And then we move to the top end startup recommendation, where we recommend three, five, or 10 recommendations to each VC. And we compare all the five algorithms to uh, the baselines, including PMF and random selection. Sorry. So first of all, uh, we find out that sampling method performs the best. And we ascribed this uh, to uh, the nature that sampling is the most natural way to approximate the exact solution, because we have to select the combination of lists altogether. And we also find out that weight and filtering perform list. And to, to uh, explain this, we can say that because we find out the weights of a larger set of candidates, and then we filter, either filter out or either uh, uh, filter, either filter out or either select the top end, but neither of them uh, actually obtain the true weight uh, with the size and uh, combination. But nevertheless, all of them perform much better than PMF, especially the adaptive ones, as we can see. And next, we look at how the uh, re uh, risk averse level can determine the performance of NDCG and MRR. We can see that similarly, there's a peak behavior, which means that there's a certain risk averse level for all the uh, VCs that can make the performance to peak. And second of all, we can see uh, from the left panel that when, when the N, when the number of recommendations uh, increases, NDCG decreases while MRR uh, increases. We ascribe this behavior to the sparsity of the data set. So for MRR, when we enlarge the recommendation list size, there, are, there will be more and more users which have got at least one correct recommendation. However, therefore, MRR increases. However, for NDCG, it is uh, very difficult to have more than one hit for each user. And since NDCG considers the whole list and the whole ranking, uh, it naturally decreases. And the behavior of the candidate set size N is similar to uh, the case when N equals to one. And here is the a relation between the performance and the sampling time. And we can also see that it, it has a, a increasing at the beginning and drops a little bit because of overfitting. So finally, uh, I'm going to show the a data analysis of the risk averse level. So the first figure, we show the distribution of the risk averse levels among all the VCs. And we can find out that it actually forms two categories. Risk neutral category with very small B and risk sensitive category with a little bit bigger risk averse level. And further, in the right figure, we show the relationship between the, right, the risk averse level and the can the number of investments the VC has made. And we find a very interesting correlation. We find out that the more the investor has already invested, the less, the more risk neutral the VC is, which is also uh, intuitive because if a VC has already invested a lot, the next investment, uh, he can be more a spec tech spectacular So here we have Startup Chill, Echo Partners, and Secro Capital, which all lies in this uh, risk neutral group. And they all have very large investment numbers. And for Allegro Venture Partners, they have, uh, it has less than 10 investments in the past, and it tend to have a very uh, a relatively large 
a relatively a sm small, a large, large B. Yeah. So uh, this work is joint done jointly done with uh, my colleague Wei Nan Zhang and uh, with the supervision of uh, our supervisor, Dr. Ji Wang. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Here we have a question. I have a question about uh, your approach because it seems you're um, treating these investments as a standard recommendation, recommendation task. Mm -hmm. So I was curious if you was, were thinking about adding some um, financial, inform, financial knowledge or financial analysis to predict which companies are more or less promising or risky or worth investing. Did you use any information like this? Uh, we, have, we didn't carry out the financial aspects uh, mm -hmm. uh, analysis, mainly because we don't have that part of data, because uh, these are only startups. We cannot obtain the risk factor or the uh, expected return of it. So we tend to use a latent factor uh, to, to evaluate these risk and relevance factors mm -hmm. instead of using financial criteria. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, one very important aspect of investment is the size of the investment. Uh, so I was wondering if you consider that in your risk assessment. So if you invest one billion dollars versus one yeah. million dollars, there's a big difference, right? Yeah, uh, there is the size or to say the amount of investment. Uh, there is a rough, est in rough amount of money uh, in the website, but it doesn't have an exact amount of money. So actually this part of information is missing and we only use a binary data set in the calculations because it has only the total amount provided by several VCs at one round. So we cannot know which VC has invested how much. So um, I have a question. I mean, have you compared your results with models that come from the field of financial calculus? Have you heard about the Black-Scholes model? Oh, you mean? I mean, there's a field called financial calculus. So there's, it's a field in which, uh, you know, uh, statistical physicians, I mean, statistical physics, you know, have developed models since in the last 30 years. So there's a very well-known model called Black-Scholes model that estimate the risk of, you know, portfolios and, you know, and prices and when a lot of, you know, um, uh, pricing, um, I mean, financial products. So there's, this is a well-estimated and well-known model. So I would well, like to know if you have compared or yeah, have we, any idea of how your model should be, would work as the same as these models. Yeah, because uh, we, we didn't uh, extensively use econometrics to assess this model. Uh, generally because we don't have that data. It, because these are, we don't have the price or we don't have the movements and we cannot estimate. And it is very difficult to obtain this uh, data for startups. So we, you, we have generally only the binary data, which is the activities uh, by the VC to the, to the uh, startups. And we don't even have the amount. So for example, if we want to calculate sharp ratio or things like that, we have to really estimate the real value of the company, which we cannot have. So here we only tend to have the binary uh, preference for these companies. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question, because initially when you showed the data set, you could see that you know, the category, like the first and second, there was very top weighted. Like specific categories were being uh, yeah. invested in by 
uh, by these VCs. Now, as yeah, the first slide. You want this yeah. one? So, is the goal then, you know, because if you see from past history that, okay, VCs have been invested, uh, you know, investing in category one or two, would there be a tendency with, with the system to sort of only focus on these two? Like, how would you diversify eventually, let's say, in category 10? Yeah, that, so we can see that here, uh, each VC tend to invest into only one, two, three uh, industrial sectors. Therefore, we cannot use topic diversification. We cannot say, for example, in music listening or a movie watching, uh, this kind of recommended systems, we can simply diversify uh, for an unknown user that we give him or her uh, several different genres of movies, but we cannot do it here because it is not usually the VC uh, does. So instead of using topic diversification, we use the, the we use a more uh, conceptual, so more abstract way to do the diversification. So first of all, we we obtain the latent factors of the all the of the all the VCs and the startups, and we diversify according to the latent factor uh, about, for example, the cosine similarity or something like that. Therefore, we uh, avoided the to implicitly using the topic information. Try to be short. So I wonder about the, the practical use layer of this uh, uh, approach, because in, in essentially this is, a, if I understand correctly, is a, a collaborative filtering approach. But for investing, uh, I mean, for collaborative filtering, there's more, you need data in order to make good recommendation. And there's also a richer, a richer problem, right? For where for investing, uh, where you know if you already get enough data, you know um, maybe it's, it, you know it's it's not. Um, I mean, there's a resource constraint problem, right? You know, you cannot re recommend say everyone to re invest into Uber because they only take you know the most you know and investors, right? Um, is that something you consider? Uh, I am not quite sure whether I fully understood your question. Uh, did you did you mean that uh, there should be a constraint? Yeah, and like for example, you know, for a new startup which hasn't taken any investment yet, you don't have any observation, so uh, you may not able to make a, a recommendation to the investors. But if you do get many data, uh, say Uber, you know, get you know. You know, ten billion, you know, investment from many companies. At that time, if you recommend Uber to the other investor, it may not be uh, practical, right? Because they cannot take any more investment. So, uh, I, you meant that uh, we sh we should concentrate on the category that the VC has already been interested. Is that what you mean? So we. But oh, that's fine. I, we can take yeah, off we, later. Thank you very much.